Hi, I'm Dr. Rich Vogel. I'm a board certified neurophysiologist and co-founder and co-chair of the NAS section on intraoperative neuromonitoring. This podcast is about neuromonitoring and covers a wide range of educational topics aimed at optimizing patient care, reducing costs, and optimizing OR efficiency. Today, I'm joined by orthopedic spine surgeon, Dr. Simon Harris. Dr. Harris completed his undergraduate and medical training at the University of Cambridge, England, before completing an orthopedic surgery residency training program at the University of Toronto. He then followed up with an AO Spine Combined Orthopedic and Neurosurgical Clinical Fellowship in Spine Surgery at the Toronto Western Hospital, University of Toronto, under the guidance of Dr. Michael Failing, Dr. Eric Massacott, Dr. Raj Rampersad, and Dr. Stephen Lewis. Dr. Harris is presently a staff surgeon in spine and orthopedics at the Scarborough Health Network in Toronto. He's also a consultant surgeon with Altum Health, WSIB, Injured Workers, Back and Neck Specialty Program at Toronto Western Hospital, University Health Network, Toronto. Dr. Harris has a mixed spine practice with a special interest in adolescent and young adult scoliosis. He joins us today to share his experiences with neuromonitoring. Simon, it's an honor to have you with us today. Good morning. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. So I, I want to spend some time today talking about, obviously, your experiences with neuromonitoring and spine surgery, but I just thought I'd ask as an introduction, uh, how long have you been in practice as a spine surgeon? Okay. I've been in practice for seven years now, and uh, the time has flown, I got to say, but um I'm at that stage, I think, in my practice where you kind of you have that kind of confidence that you you can you can manage most situations and allows you to really build on um, your, your your experience and and you know and 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 bring in some new things like interoperative neuromonitoring to help um, you know raise the bar in terms of your 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 practice. And it's really over the last four years or so that I've been increasing the uh, the sort of pediatric and young adult scoliosis work at our institute. So have you always uh, used neuromonitoring, even going back into your, your training and in, in, in fellowship? Yeah, so I was very fortunate at our, at our three major spine centers during my orthopedic residency, plus in my spine fellowship, uh, we uh, had great exposure to intraoperative neuromonitoring. It was pretty much common for, for most of the, the spine cases that were performed. And um, we certainly had, uh, had lead. Um, you know, that I was under the, the guidance of during that, that fellowship that uh, they gave great education and great teaching and really under, showed us the role of interoperative neuromonitoring and how it can uh, really make things safer for the patients and, and, and improve your outcomes overall. And, and you, you work at, at a, a very large uh, facility, world-renowned um, Toronto uh, or Canada is, is obviously a, a very big country. Um, is there is you think neuromonitoring is is kind of widely used there as it is in the U.S. or do you think it's it's more kind of sporadic and based on availability <clears throat> of resources and individual preferences? So uh, I mean, the geography is different. So the way spine uh, uh, is is distributed uh, throughout Canada is predominantly at the academic institutes where they're associated with usually with the large neurosurgery program. And so it's much more common to have uh, interoperative neuromonitoring at these sites. Where my role is um, at Scarborough Health Network, we're a large community health network that serves a, a large po- uh, population, but we're not necessarily an academic institute. And so there are a few similar sites across Canada where they have spine surgery, but may not have a full uh, neurosurgery scope. And so those institutes may not have intraoperative neuromonitoring, but the predominant academic centers will have uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring. I see. And going back to your individual practice and, and focusing uh, initially just on complex spinal deformity surgery, when when you're when you're um, treating adolescent or even younger patients, do you when when you use neuromonitoring, what neuromonitoring tests do you typically include in uh, in, in the treatment of those patients, like motor evoked potentials or SSCPs, and yeah. and um, 
how, how do you kind of weigh them in terms of the, um, the importance and how they guide your, your practice during surgery? Absolutely. So um, the primary uh, techniques that we use are motivoke potentials and SSEPs. Sometimes there's some free running EMGs. Um, sometimes you use direct pedicle screw um, stimulation. I'm sure in the background, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sebastian Fournier, who's our interoperative neuromonitor specialist, uh, I'm sure he's running lots of other things in the background and I'm sure he's got a, a big uh, a toolkit that he can he can use and bring out and every now and again he makes little suggestions why don't we try this why don't we try that and to help with this but I say the primary for me is is the motor evoke potentials and the way we sort of run it is we make sure we get good baselines and then um, every time we do something so whether that's insertion of a pedicle screw uh, perform a, a decompression or osteotomy or reduce the cord or final tighten the caps. Every time we do one of these steps, we use that as an opportunity to sort of communicate and set down a marker and say, okay, let's run the, the motor of potentials. Let's run the motor of potentials. And so each time that allows us to, to put sort of stakes in the ground to say, okay, at this point, the motors are fine. At this point, the motors are fine. At this point, the motors are fine. And for me, that's the, the sort of the, the, the strongest, um, market that we use in the most reliable things. It's not uncommon, you know, to have some slight change in SSEPs um, and there are things that we do to adjust it. And often uh, Sebastian's in the background making some technical changes, maybe it leads a little loose and things like that. But for me, in terms of, you know, what we're looking for in the outcome of the end of the surgery is to make sure the patient's legs are strong and there's no neurological injury, really looking at those motor potentials person. Great. And, and speaking of uh, changes that may occur, so we're recording this podcast in, in, in March of 2022, and we know these things kind of live forever on the internet. But just, um, just uh, in, in this month's issue of spine deformity, one of your mentors, uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis, was uh, one of um, many esteemed authors on this brand new paper that is entitled Development of Consensus-Based Best Practice Guidelines for Response to Interoperative Neuromonitoring Events in High-Risk Spinal Deformity Surgery. I'm not going to ask you about the paper because it just hit the presses this morning. Um, but, but I do want to transition to uh, what happens when the neuromonitoring signals change. So um, how do you, and I know that there can be any number of reasons, but let's just say we kind of roll out the technical issues because that's obviously the first thing that's done. Um, what, what is your approach when there's, when there's a major change to motors and or SSCPs? So uh, it's interesting you brought up uh, Dr. Lewis's paper because um, I think a lot of my understanding of the flow and how to respond to an interoperative neuromonitoring change has been education through uh, Dr. Lewis and, and his sort of protocol of managing it. So I think I've kind of absorbed that, that, that guidance. And so um, similar to his paper in 2019 in the Global Spine Journal, kind of break it down into two areas. One is sort of unilateral changes, which are usually a direct trauma uh, versus bilateral changes, which are often more systemic. So either, um, you know, uh, low hemoglobin, hypotension, or when you've corrected the cord and there's too much tension on the artery of Adamkovich, for example. Mm -hmm. But I think the key thing is to have that open line of communication with your neuromonitor. And so every time we say we insert a screw, we lay down that marker and that allows us that if there's a change, we know we only have to go one page back in the story. We've only got to go back one screw and we can work out where the problem is because we've been doing the due diligence along the way. And that's what really allows us to, to do it as safe as possible and minimize um, you know, the duration of, of those motor potentials, which may lead to a more negative outcome. And so by having that sort of working relationship with your neuromonitor, it, it makes it really easy to address the problems that the neuromonitor feels free to speak up. He's comfortable with the communication in the room. Uh, he works very well with our anesthetist. Uh, again, that allows to, you know, to have that conversation freely flowing so that if there is a change, then that becomes the center of attention at that moment. Nobody's panicking. We know what the steps are that we need to take to, um, you know, to reverse those, those changes. 
I, I think that's a fantastic approach, and, and that's one that I typically recommend when you know when I talk to surgeons as well. There's nothing like putting in you know say 16 thoracic screws and then doing a motor afterwards and finding out there's a change and wondering which one of those is the problem and having to reverse all of those steps. Um, so I know that you you've mentioned a couple of times you work with a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Sebastian Fourier, who is, um, you know, he's known here in the U.S. He's, you know, widely considered to be one of the best neurophysiologists there in Canada. Um, and, and you sound like you have a good working relationship. And, and you mentioned good communication, which I think is um, you know, always goes a long way. It makes the world go around. Um, but in your mind, um, what from, from a spine surgeon's perspective, what makes for a good neurophysiologist? So first of all, I'm going to say that uh, I, I'm so lucky that, that I was put in contact with Dr. Fournier and he, he's become part of our team um, because, because his work that he does is great. And it's really helped us raise the bar in delivery of care uh, for uh, deformity surgery in our region. Now, I think what makes uh, a great neurophysiologist and a great uh, team member is communication. And in the same of any team, whether, um, you know, we're talking about uh, airplanes or they're talking about sports teams, it's that open line of communication and really putting away sort of any hierarchy. We're all here to help the patient and the patient have the best outcome they can have. My point from the surgery point of view is to make sure they get the best correction that they can get. From the anesthetist point of view, make sure that all the blood pressure parameters and the pain control components are there. And from the neurophysiologist is to protect um, the, the, the spinal cord, make sure what we're doing is as safe as possible. So um, for me, that is the key thing, is just having that working relationship and being free to talk, you know, it, uh, talk throughout the, com throughout the entire operation, you know, even the beginning when, when things aren't stressful, things are low key, you're exposing, it's just having that open dialogue, um, you know, making sure everything's okay with the, with the motors, with this, uh, the evoke potentials that your baselines are coming back down to normal as the anesthetic wears off from induction, various things like that, just starting that day off like that, having that communication so that when the alarm bells are ringing, mm -hmm. We know that it's okay to speak up because at the end of the day, it's all about the safety for the patient. And um, I'm just very lucky to have um, Sebastian as part of that team. Absolutely. So um, just kind of transitioning out of the um, uh, pediatric deformity, do you also uh, operate for degenerative spinal disorders in yeah. uh, adult? Yeah. yeah, so I have a, I have a mixed... Um, uh, practice. So because I, I, I'm not in one of the academic centers in a large community uh, hospital, we do cover a large area. And so we need to provide um, as many sort of resources as we can to, in a sense, I would say protect the downtown academic community, but where they have to deal with more, perhaps the more quaternary um, complex cases. So um, I do have a, a mixed spine practice. Um, I do a lot of cervical um, so disc replacements, uh, degenerative spinal myelopathy cases, radiculopathy, um, as well as adult degenerative lumbar cases. In terms of utilizing neuromonitoring, I don't for those cases. And I would like to, but uh, the challenge is access to the resource. Mm -hmm. So um, the way I was able to bring intraoperative neuromonitoring into my institute was when we had a change in how the delivery of care for our scoliosis patients was delivered. And I was asked to take over that practice. And I said, very happy to do it. Well trained in it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a passion of mine. And um, if we're going to deliver it as safely as possible, there are two things that I would recommend. Number one is intraoperative neuromonitoring and number two being a 3D navigation um, mm. system. And so the hospital was able to provide that for me for these more, more complex cases but we don't have Sebastian or an equivalent sort of uh, contracted out for every spine case that we do. Is it something that I would like? Absolutely. Is it something we're going to hopefully work towards uh, with the hospital network to, to build these resources for our community? I, I really do hope so uh, in the near future. Wonderful. So um, before we part, just um, one more question. Do you have any uh, clinical pearls that you'd like to share with the audience based on your experience with neuromonitoring? Um, absolutely. So it, it, sometimes you get little surprises on, on 
on the things that the interoperative neural monitoring team can do. Every now and again, they may pick up something. For example, there's a change in the SACPs in, in one limb and you haven't done anything. And so they'll go in and adjust the leg position and then those changes will resolve. And so a lot of it is as the surgeon, you know your piece, but you don't know what you don't know. And having a, a, somebody like Sebastian or a neuro monitor who, who is seeing it from a different point of view and has that diagnostic ability and that, that knowledge and experience, it's, it's, it's kind of unparalleled and it really does raise the bar for the patient care. In terms of the pearls for um, any surgeon who wants to bring it into their, um, their hospital, try, you know, push for it because it really is worthwhile. There may be an upfront cost, but in terms of reducing the, the complication rate for that individual patient, the, there's no question that it's value for money. Um, when you do get someone on your team, build that relationship, make sure you have a good communication, make sure there's no hierarchy, everyone feels free to speak up for the safety of that individual. And that's what's going to make you uh, more successful. That's what's going to improve your patient outcomes and really make for a better day in the operating room for everyone. That's great advice. Thank you. Dr. Harris, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to, to join us. We really appreciate it. To our audience, uh, we'll be back in a couple months with another episode about neuromonitoring and spine surgery. So thanks for listening.